can't hear you anymore. I've lost some. You good? Um. Oh. Yeah, I'm good. I, okay. I had I had the wrong mic up. Okay. Are you good? So, now? Uh, yeah, everything's fine. All right. Keep going. So, go. have I introduced everything, or then but nobody? Go. You me. need to introduce. All right. Again. So I'm gonna do it again because you didn't hear me. So, hello. My name is Marilyn Shannon. This is the Breaking Free Show. I'm very happy to have you all with us today. I've been gone for a couple of weeks visiting my mother, who is 93 and a beautiful woman. And doing some writing and all that kind of stuff. But it's really good to be back. And we have a show in store with a very important guest. So before we do that, I want to say hi to Amnon, our producer. Hello. How are you? I'm just fine. How are you? I'm good. Did you have a good uh, Mother's Day weekend? I had a great Mother's Day weekend. And we got the best present, present that the your... daughter could give. And what was your present? She graduated from... Uh, Electrical engineering at NC State. Congratulations. And I know his daughter really earned it, boy. You know, sometimes, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And sometimes you just have to, I mean, it took her 10 years. Yeah. Right? She, she didn't take it seriously all this time. And in the last two years, she did. And, that, and, she, and she's successful. And she has yeah. a lot to look back on and go, yes. Um, and so do you. Yeah. Right? And, and I can, I, can we lower the mic on your side? Guys, I mean the speaker. Again, do you do that? maybe you yeah. maybe you brought it up because guest. you couldn't hear Marilyn earlier. Okay, okay. Keep here going we go. Listening. So, anytime during the show, you can call in to nine one nine five one eight nine seven seven three, or you can connect with us on computers two K Voice. That will be uh, on Skype Voice. You can call into the studio. You can connect with us on our chat. We'd love to have you there. Just put your name under the video and you can participate in there. Ask questions, comment, whatever you like. And today's guest is an extraordinary uh, person, a friend, and I had the pleasure of hearing him speak before. And what he speaks about is so relevant and so interesting that I brought him here to the Breaking Free show. Because you can't have enough choice when we're out in this world. And things are going on in our lives. You know, it. we are our best advocate to do whatever it is that we need to do for whatever reason we need to do it. And in certain cases, you go to this expert. In certain cases, you go to that expert. Sometimes you go to a doctor. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you do a whole bunch of doctors. Sometimes you do a whole bunch of alternative things. But to be educated and to be able to be educated so that you can be the one that makes a decision is so important. So today we have Manfred Mueller on, who is a homeopath, and he is brilliant, and I want to welcome him to the show. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing well. Thanks. And Good. you? I am doing great. Thank you for asking. Not very often a guest says, and how are you doing? And I say, great. Thank you. So first of all, tell everybody who you are and how you've been doing it and how long, and all that kind of good stuff. Well, I'm a homeopathic practitioner. I now um, do only over-the-phone consultations with my clients. Um, my clients are all over the world, and uh, I get calls from anywhere in the world. And uh, basically, I take cases, homeopathic cases, over the phone. Uh, we also have regular follow-ups, and uh, with those uh, our clients and uh, I have done this for 40 years. 40? Yes. You have been a homeopath for 40 years? That's correct. Wow. How long ago actually did homeopathy begin? Um, homeopathy was introduced or developed, you could say, in uh, the late um, 1700s, actually. Um, the law of similars, which is one of the chief tenets of homeopathy, was uh, stated by Dr. Samuel Hahnemann in 1796. Hahnemann conducted all kinds of research throughout his life, and he lived till 1843. 
So homeopathy was developed during those years, years by Dr. Hahnemann, and it spread all over the world. So can you uh, explain this no notion of similarities? Yes. Similar, I, that's notion very interesting. Similar? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, it's the discovery by Hahnemann that uh, medicine that can produce a similar syndrome or group of symptoms can be used for a disease with that syndrome. Um, and that doesn't matter what the diagnosis of the disease is. So for example, we may have in, uh, in kidney disorders, we may have a, a, a disorder very similar swelling protein um, excretion of the urine. Um, these, are, these are typical symptoms of chronic kidney disorders, like nephrotic syndrome, for example which resembles the syndrome produced in, uh, under, under controlled, condition, controlled conditions when you tested on healthy people by the venom of the honeybee. That's an example. So Hahnemann discovered that when the syndrome of the medicine matches or suits that, or resembles, I guess I'm using the term resembles that, of the, uh, of the condition, then it's likely to induce curative responses. That means in the body, it actually stimulates healing. Whereas when it's different or even opposite, it may suppress the symptom temporarily, but the medicine have to, has to be, has to, it has to, you have to keep giving the medicine. So these are basic principles of medicinal treatment that Hahnemann discovered and his discovery revolutionized medicine in Germany and in many countries in the 19th century. The way medicine was practiced, for example, homeopathic medicine was a mainstream form of medicine in the United States, uh, well past the turn of the century. Um, and then it disappeared because of active and high homeopathy, homeopathy activities engaged by the developing pharmaceutical industry. Wow, I didn't realize all of that. Um, specifically, the, they, there was a Flexner report, which was organized apparently by very wealthy people uh, who were already invested in the so-called pharmaceutical industry. And they studied medical schools in the United States in 1910. The Flexner Report was issued and found to have basically uh, no science in any of the things they investigated. They investigated naturopathic medical schools, homeopathic medical schools. Uh, they, they investigated all of the so-called natural medical approaches in the United States and deemed them non-scientific, whereas the only kind of method, method of medicine at that time was deemed scientific was the so-called allopathic medical school, the school of medicine, I should say. In other words, the uh, philosophical approach of allo allopathic medical schools. Now, I probably should explain what allopathy means, but I think I'll just leave it at that. It's regular medicine. It's the only thing that was deemed scientific then. Today, it's the only kind of medicine pretty much that's being practiced in the United States with a few exceptions. So Manfred, why the, why the shift? Why did that happen? Why did yeah, medicine Why did shift? that happen? Yes. <laughs> um, you could, I mean, a lot of people are saying the Flexion Report was biased. It deliberately wanted to get rid of natural medicine, like naturopathic medicine. In those days, we also had a school called the Eclectic School. The eclectic School was a um, medicine, direction in medicine, and attempted, attempted to rescue all of the various methods that had been already used traditionally, like by the American Indians, indigenous, indigenous peoples, uh, things that people knew worked things that were used widely at the pioneer, uh, at the frontier, American frontier, and apparently worked. Naturopathy, naturopathic physicians, 
all of their schools were investigated. So all of these investigations found basically none of the, the natural schools were scientific. That also included chiropractic. Chiropractic was investigated. Osteopathic medicine was deemed unscientific. In the end, the only thing that was scientific was the uh, uh, kind of medicine that relied on, in those days, already the beginning of synthetic drugs. Drugs that could be patented and that one could make a big profit of. And that is the only medicine that is practiced today. Right. So this notion of creating a similar environment is, uh -huh. it, is what homeopathy is. You create the similar environment and then you can heal, cure the symptoms or the condition. Well, right? what, we, what we try to do is study each medicinal substance that can be natural. And most of our medicines are natural. So let me give you an example, another example. Uh, for example, um, an, an herb, a plant. Um, we have many medicinal plants in the wild, growing in the wild in America, in North America, there's uh, uh, thousands of medicinal plants. Many of them have already been used traditionally as medicines. Uh, when they're tested under controlled conditions uh, on healthy people, they can produce a syndrome, a group of symptoms. And that group of symptoms is used to use them for disorders. Now, that seems paradoxical. Why would you want to introduce or induce a group of symptoms in a sick person? Mm -hmm. Well, in homeopathy, we actually don't. We use the medicine not only for similar syndromes, but also we use them in extremely high dilutions. So these high dilutions of these very natural and medicinal substances can trigger in healthy people um, uh, purative effects that um, help the body heal itself. Mm -hmm. That is the basic idea of homeopathy. So let me ask you something. So you said you started 40 years ago. What triggered you personally to go into homeopathy? What's your backstory? I had uh, gotten a degree in uh, psychology. I had already started my first job in psychology, worked with a schizophrenic patient. I also had some family experience with uh, mental illness. I was very concerned and wanted to learn more. I considered going to med school at the time. I was in my early 20s. Um, at some point, I think in 1978, I met Dr. George Guess who was a, a conventional physician who had just started to study homeopathy. And um, we were, uh, we had met like in social situations. We talked a lot about uh, treatment, about medical treatment. I was very concerned at the time about the detrimental effect of uh, medical psychiatric drugs on the patients that I was seeing. I was very unhappy with what they did to people. I didn't feel like much healing was going on. And so we had lots of conversation. Uh, George gave me um, um, information in those days. This was before the internet. So um, I, got, I got the little books to read. I've got pamphlets and I investigated on my own. I got to the, went to the library. I read book after book. I bought books. And then finally uh, found that it was uh, possible to get started in um, educating myself in how to actually uh, learn homeopathy. I got Dr. Hahnemann's Organon, which was his uh, original guidelines for hom homeopathic practice. I attended a lot of seminars were given by various different physicians from all, from all over the world. And that's how I got into homeopathy myself. I eventually, in 1986, um, uh, after after treating some many many people part time in 1986, I finally had the courage to uh, open my own uh, practice in homeopathy, and uh, and I guess uh, I've been a full time homeopath ever since. So, what were you treating people for in your early career as as a homeopath? Well, like, at first, uh, I recognized the uh, potential of homeopathy to uh, to um, help people um, on the psychological level. I thought uh, that was my, my primary interest. 
but very quickly people were asking me can you help me with this can you help me with that and uh, i uh, um, made um, also expanded in my own education and i got into more complicated complicated and more difficult syndromes that people presented and uh, were able, was able in many cases to match that with a medicine, which is uh, the essence of, of homeopathy. And uh, many people recovered from um, fair, fairly uh, difficult disorders. Eventually, I felt like this was spectacular enough to, uh, to uh, get get uh, the public to know about because I felt there was no education to the general public about homeopathy. I myself had not heard much about homeopathy prior to meeting Dr. Gass. Mm -hmm. And uh, you never heard homeopathy talked about on television. So you could say uh, homeopathy is the best kept secret in medicine. <laughs> well, you're going to give us some of that, uh, uh, that secret. So through your career, and, and currently, one of the areas that I wanted to talk to you about was cancer, because I know you, you're doing a lot of work in there. But, you know, after that, I, I'd love to go back and touch upon some of the other areas that you have, you know, been practicing in and focusing on, because I'm, I'm assume, and, and you're a generalist on some level, you can do a lot of different things. So talk to us about cancer and homeopathy. Well, cancer is a particularly difficult chronic disorder uh, to treat in homeopathy. It, it takes a lot of knowledge. Um, it's very different from, you could say, from other more common, perhaps, dis disorders in dealing with it. Now, in homeopathy, um, you uh, can often uh, look at the whole person and see what tendency the person has. And uh, that is true also in cancer a person can have tendency towards cancer, and that is, uh, you could say, hereditary. Um, we um, homeopaths have known about this for more than nearly two centuries, maybe over two centuries. So in homeopathy, uh, we look at that aspect in a person. We also look at the specific pathology. So um, what particular cancer are we dealing with? And uh, we need to know which specific medicines match which particular tumor. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that required specialization. I did have to go into that, that uh, particular specialty in addition to the gen more general approach that I had. Uh, and, and also, I went into other specialties too. But I did uh, specialize in cancer and do a lot of my own research into what medicines can cover which cancer or what, which medicine can be successful in which cancer. Mm -hmm. And so what, ha what are some of the things you're discovering? Is it, I mean, are there certain themes or trends with cancer or is it specific to the, I mean, obviously it's specific to the, a person and, well, and to the it type. it's specific but... to the person in the sense that the people who tend to get cancer often have a hereditary predisposition. Now, the, what's different in homeopathy, this is, this is pretty much commonly accepted in medicine, that there is an oncogene that gets activated somehow. And of course, uh, that oncogene can be uh, activated by environmental factors, toxins, for example, so-called carcinogens. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's an underlying existing hereditary predisposition that can be identified with other than genetic methods. So for example, homeopathy, we look at characteristics of the um, human beings that develop cancer. We see that they have certain characteristics. So Dr. Fubister, a British homeopath, discovered certain characteristics in children of people who had cancer. So they already, as children, inherited certain characteristics that included a cafe au lait complexion that included a certain physiological um, um, a tendency to get bluish sclerae. Sclerae are the white part of the eye. And all of these could be observed in children already. So homeopaths early on, long before the uh, human genome was investigated, 
uh, saw there was clearly hereditary factors that were transmitted from the parents to the children. And uh, we learned to identify, we meaning homeopaths as a profession, learn to identify those characteristics. Mm -hmm. And when we come across those characterist characteristics, we also learn how to find a medicine that matches this uh, group of characteristics. And there, there are many medicines that cover cancer. Yeah, I mean, I've always been fascinated with homeopathy um, when my friend Debbie um, was here because I, when I would go sit with her and she would ask me a million questions. And then when she got an answer, there would be a million more. And break it down and break it down and break it down to a flower or to, the, you know, to some kind of an animal or some, some, right. something. And it was just fascinating. And for somebody like myself who has no previous knowledge about this, I'm wondering, you know, she would give me a little bottle with some liquid in it. And she'd tell me to tap my, you know, tap it like a hundred times and take it, you know, under my tongue, a few drops, whatever, like 10 times a day. And I'm like, how can that help me? How, I mean, and it would be fascinating because, because so often it did. And I'm, and it just was so curious to me. And now we're talking cancer. And so how okay. does that work? You know, I mean, with, with, breast cancer and all the different kinds of cancers. How does that happen? What is it, what, what is it that is being created through homeopathy that can help with cancer? And, how, well, and the other question is, yes. I guess, how, how soon after a diagnosis can it, it I mean, is, does it work or is it, uh, just the predisposition, you have to get it before even the diagnosis. I mean, talk some about that too. Yes. Well, you know, if you have a predisposition, then there, it's a good idea to get homeopathic treatment for the predisposition. And I believe that you can actually, not in every case, of course, but you can actually um, reduce your risk of cancer in doing so. Uh, so for example, um, having seen thousands and thousands of patients over the years, you see how many of them do develop cancer. Very few uh, who have done this, who have to have undergone several years of preventive treatment, actually came down with cancer. I'm talking about less than 2%. Um, that's, a, that's an estimate that's based on my own personal observation. It's difficult, it's not a formal study. I'd love, love to do a formal study about this. Uh, there have been studies about homeopathic treatment um, and uh, those studies have uh, shown in many cases specific effects of specific medicines. Homeopathic medicines have been shown to be effective for, can effective for cancer in many different kinds of studies. So for example, in vitro, in vitro means in the laboratory, in the, you could say in the, uh, um, uh, on a cellular level often. Uh, so cancer cell, cell lines have been treated if you will, with homeopathic medicines. And they have shown um, cell death as a result of homeopathic treatment. This is done by carefully um, dividing two groups, a control group and a treated group. And the control group gets nothing but water. The treated group gets a homeopathic medicine. And the, um, um, so many of the studies have even taken into consideration the potential um, biased effect of the scientists involved, so they would um, blind the study. That means the, the people who actually administered the medicine did not know whether they were administering um, virum, which is actual medicine, or placebo, which is a pretend medicine or a, basically a, a substance that looks like the medicine. Um, so those have been conducted. There are many, I found hundreds of studies that show that homeopathic treatment works in cancer. And what happens, what is the, why doesn't it work? I guess is my next question. At what why? point, why doesn't it work? What do you mean why doesn't I mean, it, 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 it I mean, it works and then there are times that it doesn't work. What would be the disposition? Oh, there are many, many oh, reasons many, many. in life. Many reasons that uh, patients encounter in their lives mm -hmm. cause 
a treatment not to have an effect. How much of how much of a person's uh, condition is affected by them emotionally? By their emotion? Yes. You want my honest answer? I want your, uh, that's why you're here. I feel like it's overrated. Ah. I think the biggest factor in cancer is heredity. Number one, heredity. Number two, environment. With that, I'm saying environment that could be carcinogenic. There are certain things that you can be exposed to can directly trigger cancer. Specific poisons. Cancer is a toxic disease, no question about it. If you're exposed to those poisons, like formaldehyde is a common poison. More and more people are exposed to it almost daily because it's a byproduct, or you could say it's an outgassing product from furniture. For, and from for many uh, many products, um, but you see the people that succumb are the weaker ones. They're already weak to start with. Are they the weak? Are they weak physically? Do not get cancer are the ones who have very strong. When you study, like I have now for thousands of patients, the family history, for example, that means the diseases that run in a person's family, and then you get patients who tell you, oh. My mother is 97 years old and she's still kicking. My father is uh, approaching 100 and still doing well. You don't see much cancer in those people. But the people whose parents died in their 50s, they're very often they have what we call in homeopathy, the cancer diathesis. And they're much more likely to succumb to cancer during treatment as well as and get cancer in the first place. That's very, you know, it's really interesting to hear you say that. I mean, because it's, it, 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 you know, when you sit back, it appears to be the truth. I mean, when people turn around, they say to you, you have good genes. You know, we kind of laugh it off, but there is it's something to be said for that. No doubt. No doubt. No, I mean, down yeah. there's other, another thing. You brought up the uh, psychological effects, mm -hmm. emotional. There's no doubt that there is something to that too. If you are under a lot of stress, like going through a deep depression, let's say, it affects your immune system. The immune system plays a major role in healing and whether you recover from a disease or not. So that's an important factor too. But you see, Coming back to the hereditary, the heredity determines which people bounce back. So you see, we are interested in not just um, the mechanisms. We're not sure there's mechanisms, but that's not the only thing we look at. In homeopathy, we look at the whole picture. That means the patient's environment, the circumstances, the family circumstances, what's going on in their lives. All of these things matter. And whatever we choose as a medicine is directed at improving that situation. So, so how relevant has it been through your career that you started this journey as a psychologist? Good question. Uh, one, one uh, I think the most important uh, factor that was um, interesting to me in homeopathy was the connection between mind and body. There's no doubt that there's a connection. Um, but even more important than that is a more of a theoretical thing that might not be of interest to everyone, but I um, saw in homeopathy philosophically a perfect science because it took into consideration the the human experience, as opposed to just the uh, empirical facts. Medicine, scientific medicine, as a rule, especially medical practice, only looks as the scientifically verifiable facts. That means a machine, a test, um, technology is used to look at a physical state objectively from the outside and find something wrong. This is very clearly the case when you look at the tumor. You need to use uh, imaging, x-rays, PET scans, uh, MRIs to find certain tumors. 
So those are technologies that can ascertain whether there's factual, factually something there. But what you overlook in all of that is human experience, human relationships, how people feel, mm -hmm. how people relate to each other and how that affects their health. Now, that, ha that has been looked into um, over the past 30 years, more and more scientists have started to develop methods of even making a scientific study of that. And so we know much more than we ever used to know about the health effects of human emotions, but um, it's not being taken into consideration at all in the way medicine is practiced today. Uh, so today, a doctor is concerned about a diagnosis and a medication that is, in most cases, 90% of the cases, uh, that is intended to suppress the symptom of that disorder. So I, I, I know I'm getting a little theoretical no, here. No, no, so no, no. But because I mean, we experience yeah, because okay. we ex we experience this even with a cold. All the medicate. Well, I, I won't say all, and I'm not a doctor. But m many of the medications that you get for a cold is a suppressant. Yes. I mean, absolutely, mostly. That's the simplest thing. It's also true thing. with many other disorders. I mean, even serious disorders like heart disease. Um, let's say your problem is atrial fibrillation, common um, disorder, which is paroxysmal, as I very sudden sometimes, but then becomes chronic, uh, increase in heartbeat very rapid heartbeat, so rapid that it uh, reduces the effic efficacy of the heart in pumping the blood. And it can actually precipitate a heart attack. Um, so in that disorder, you take a drug that slows the heart down. It's, in other words, again, suppresses the disorder. Even though in this case, you're not primarily interested in how you feel and trying to make you feel better, but you're trying to prevent serious outcomes. So it's sort of justified in that situation to do that. But of course, wouldn't it be much better if you induced healing, restorative, or reparative effects like homeopathy attempts to do, which ultimately changes things so the AFib goes away? Um, the same thing with a cold. Take a look at the cold. Underlying, we know, we understand that colds are caused by viruses. Um, there are millions of viruses out there that can cause, and, and many of them can cause a cold. But the fact is, uh, suppressing the symptoms isn't good enough. In homeopathy, what we do is we stimulate the person's immunity against these viruses and help them get over the cold that way. So overall, the idea is that next time they encounter another virus, that may be stronger, their immune system may be stronger, they may not get the cold. And that's something that you see typically in people who are treated homeopathically on a regular basis, um, is they're far more resistant against the common cold and often they're far more resistant against infections in general. What about, and I, the speed? Because I mean, it, it, sometimes I think that's a, um, an illusion is that you take regular medicine and it acts faster than a homeopathic remedy? Is there something to that fact or not? Actually, that's not true. A homeopathic medicine acts very rapidly. Okay. okay. Sometimes in seconds. In seconds. So let me give you an example. I attended a wedding and there was a little girl, well, maybe eight years old, who... Um, had a history of anaphylactic reactions to bee stings. And as we were there in the outdoors, outdoors wedding, um, suddenly the mother yells, and then somebody yells, Manfred, Manfred, can you help? And then the, I, I went over there, the mother asked, asked me if I could help, help a, 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 a bee sting. Her daughter had gotten stung in the finger. And she had forgotten her epinephrine kit. And uh, so she was terrified what would happen. I had absolutely no problem with pulling a uh, over-the-counter homeopathic 
while out of my, I had to go to my car and I had to, had to have my kit, remedy kit with me, pulled a vial of Apis mellifica, which is a homeopathic medicine that often counters these type of reactions, actually made from the honeybee. So uh, you understand there's a connection here. Right. It can produce a similar syndrome. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the medicine induced immediately a relief. This was seconds. You could tell this girl was swollen up with her finger. She was uh, gasping for air. Um, that's an eight-year-old girl. She didn't know one way or the other. She just um, had symptoms from that honey bee sting. She was developing symptoms already that could have led to an anaphylactic reaction or was part of an anaphylactic, you could say the beginnings of an anaphylactic reaction. And uh, one pellet under her tongue completely changed this in seconds to where you could see her sigh of relief. You could see her smiling, whereas before she was in a, had the terrified look on her face. So uh, homeopathic medicines do act mm -hmm. instantly in some cases. However, there are chronic disorders where homeopathic medicines are given for months. And over months, they induce changes that ultimately change a chronic syndrome that's been there for years. Of course, that's going to take um, uh, months to, to, uh, to have that effect. In uh, my practice, we have a saying, a steady drop hollows the stone. And homeopathic medicine, we can give daily doses of medicines, and we do routinely, especially in my practice. So we can induce changes that are permanent. Um, and that's also pretty much what studies, what research has found. That's what it does. It triggers pathways in the body that ultimately heal or cure the disorder. And this is true also coming back to cancer. This is true also and possible in cancerous tumors. Now, the factor that's important here that you brought up is time. Do you have the time to trigger the change? And that depends on when the diagnosis is made. So when a diagnosis has been made early on in the game, when a tumor is still um, measured in millimeters, you have a much better chance of curing that cancer than if you are in a fourth stage, say, bladder cancer, which is in most cases fatal. And, and if not curing it, then definitely, I mean, I saw it with Debbie. I mean, when she went for her and she got her diagnosis, you know, it was like, go home and, you know, get ready. You're not going right. to make it. And it really she, depends on the diagnosis, what it is and so forth. But Debbie did pretty well, didn't she? She did well for years. For years. For exactly. years. I mean, for several years when they gave her, you know, a life sen a, a death sentence. She went home and she took, ev did everything she could possibly, I, I mean, I watched, I heard. She did everything she could possibly do, you know, with homeopathic remedies and she lasted for years. But even... Even where homeopathic treatment doesn't lead to a cure because it's not time, um, because of other adverse factors, we see um, in virtually every case, dramatic improvement in the quality of life. That's what we hear from the patients themselves, from the families. We hear it also from studies. So in Europe, especially, um, homeopathic oncology is a much more widely practiced field, and uh, it's it's done in hospitals. It's done by medical doctors, and uh, uh, there are studies on this to see how effective it is. And that's one of the things that you find, even when uh, homeopathy does not work to the point where we like it to work, uh, we do see uh, patients love homeopathy for that reason. They feel better. Right. Right. Well, I remember many years ago, I had a really bad cold and I was just really, really bad. And Debbie gave me a couple of things. I took a nap and I woke up and I was completely healed. I mean, I mean, completely not a sniffle, not a cough. Not, and it freaked me out. 
Yes. I mean, literally, I have to. It, for, she gave me some the something about um, eagle or something, or something. The energy of eagle or I, I can't even remember. And it freaked me out. I was so I I was like I, I had nothing, and I couldn't believe it. anything could go. I could go away that way. Yes. You know, just take a nap and wake up. And I was perfectly fine. I mean, it literally freaked me out. I mean, I actually I had a similar experience. I had, uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I ultimately got into homeopathy. One one day we were um, going to hear uh, uh, some music. Uh, Dr. Guess and I and a, a bunch of other people were walking in a cold wind in Asheville, North Carolina, and. Uh, at the end of the evening, I had a terrible sore throat. And I knew this kind of sore throat, by the next day, I would be in bed with a fever. And it would take me 10, maybe a week to 10 days to get over it. I asked Dr. Guess, I said, George, can you give me, can you recommend a remedy for me? This is the first time I'd ever tried homeopathy. He gave me a pellet under the tongue. Oh, he asked me a few questions, just a few questions. He asked, how are you feeling otherwise? How are you feeling emotionally? I said, well, now I'm kind of anxious. And of course, it was obvious that we had a cold, dry wind. He gave me aconite, aconitum napellus. And uh, by the time I got home, I felt better. By the next day, my cold was gone. The sore throat was gone. Everything was gone. I thought I had experienced a miracle. And uh, it taught me that there is something out there that I did not yet understand that I need to pursue and really not just uh, believe or not believe. This is not what this was about. This was about finding out the facts about this. And of course, I have done this ever since. Yeah, it works from the inside out, right? Yep. So we have um, Kathy on our uh, chat is saying, I feel like it's mostly about how early you catch it as far as any treatment. What would you say about that? Could you repeat the question? I yes. could not hear you. Yes. She's, uh, she says, I feel that it's mostly about how early you catch it as far as any treatment. Well, definitely true. Mm. It depends how early you patch it. Yes. The earlier, the better. And Amnon has a question. I, I remember, Manfred, that when Kat, when uh, Debbie started doing the show, one of the first few shows that she did, for the whole week, I had a red eye. I mean, it's like my eye was full of blood. I yeah. went to the doctor, and they tried this, and they tried that, and different things. And that day was a week, and I went to the doctor that morning and they gave me steroids and I came to the studio and she looked at me, she said, what, what's wrong with your eye? And I said, I don't know, but that's, they gave me this. And she looked and she said, that's steroids. And I said, yeah. And she said, no, 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 don't no, You can't take that. And she took two pills and she said, put it under your tongue. I said, okay. And half an hour later, she said, go, go to the bathroom, look in the mirror. And my eye was completely white. What they tried with all kinds of pills and drops and antibiotics and all, two pills and bam. That was it. It was gone. So, I mean, I was exposed to natural medicine back in Israel when I was growing up, but not pills. It was always something that you have to concoct yourself. And this was, this was an eye opener. It, yeah, it, it really, I mean, it's, and, and I'm not one of those people who, you know, I don't chase every, everything and I'm not, I mean, you know, I just don't do that. But, and for those of you who are listening and wondering who is Debbie, well, Debbie had a show on and it was all about homeopathy and we actually, it's called a health in show and it talks about all avenues of homeopathy, all types of things. And it's on tomorrow at 10 AM, just so you know, we're on once a month and we've continued it, but Debbie did pass away from cancer uh, last year, but I've I've heard Manfred speak before and wanted him very much to come on to this show to expose all of you out there who might not have heard the extent of what you're hearing now about homeopathy. Because when you talk about breaking free, I mean it is 
something you should be aware of, period. So that's who we're referring to. And she was a very dear friend of ours. And, you know, right. And Kathy adds here, she said, I was deeply grieving after the death of my mother. Mm -hmm. Very teary. She continued to ask questions. Debbie. Right. After about 15 minutes, I realized I was no longer crying and calm. So here's, here's an, so we've talked about different things that can um, have an influence, the environment, hereditary, the human condition, which I believe so strongly human experience, which most people, when, you know, nobody takes the time, not most doctors do not take the time. They don't have the time. They have to be in and out of the, the um, examining room in five minutes. They don't have the time to ask you those questions. The other question, and I want, and I love, I would like to go into a little bit more detail about those. The other question I'm interested in is the, about the homeopath. How much does the actual homeopath themselves influence the condition or the healing or the prognosis or the whatevers? Yes, good question. That is another aspect of the placebo effect, which is, uh, at work always in every healing relationship, um, a healer in the, the healed. Whenever you encounter uh, this relationship, you need to take into consideration potential um, a role that this relationship itself plays on the outcome of the healing. Um, I have asked myself that same question from the very beginning when I first set out to try, try homeopathy, when I did it with uh, friends, relatives, and finally with strangers, complete strangers who did not know me, who came and who came. And I've uh, written up many of my cases. They've been published. Um, when you read them, read them, and I recently did that because I did a collection. I put, put together a collection of cases, and it's very clear that in some cases, yes, my person had something to do, had an effect, but there was no evidence of suggestion of any kind in my case. Um, especially in the beginning, I was myself quite skeptical of homeopathy. I uh, now, well, for the past 15 years, 14, 15 years, um, have a phone practice. That means we talk on the phone only. I make it clear what I think, in, especially when, when we have serious chronic illness, that I believe that this can go one of two ways. Either um, we see improvement or we don't. I make that very clear from the very beginning. I ask them to keep an open mind. That's it. I do not require that they believe in homeopathy, so I don't believe I'm... I'm asking for um, the belief factor. In other words, you don't have to join my church to get well. Um, um, some people have told me, and some of those um, uh, testimonials are on video, and they've been put on YouTube by um, our staff. Um, one client comes to mind and we call them clients by the way i don't call i don't have patients i'm not a medical doctor i don't have patients patients um requires that you do what the doctor tells you to do client is something that you come and you ask me for information i can provide you with information but you what you do with it i have no direct influence on and uh but coming back to the client who did the testimonial, she said she thought when she came to my practice, this was still in person, uh, she listened to me explain homeopathy briefly and she thought at the end of the, co the consultation, she thought I was an absolute kook. She used that word, I was an absolute kook. She thought I was completely crazy, but because a friend of her had come to me and referred her to me, and had gotten well in a few months from her or whatever ailed her. She had chronic pain. Um, this client tried it too. Um, by the way, she suffered from uh, post-polio syndrome. And uh, 
she had been in a wheelchair off and on because of extreme pain, pain of her legs, pain of her whole body. And uh, um, she tells in her testimony how she got well within two months. She didn't believe anything I said, but she was she resolved that she was going to try it. So I run into that a lot. I also work with animals. Many of the uh, pets, the animals, the horses, the, uh, the, the animals that get medicine, that get, get, we don't even know whether they, they, who, who gives them the medicine half the time, but they often get well. Mm -hmm. We recently had a case of cancer in a dog who got well in a matter of less than three months. The tumor disappeared. Um, we also have plants that we've treated. And I started with my own plants. I remember a, uh, um, what did they call these plants? I forget now. A jade plant. Um, it was not looking too well. It's starting to get, turn brown. And I was going off for a trip for a week. And we had a babysitter, and I instructed the babysitter to give, give uh, the water, water the plant, but also give a dose of silica, homeopathic silica, to the plant. Because to, to me, it looked like it was losing its grit, which is the indication for sil silica. So uh, when we came back, the plant had recovered. Hmm. I remember a, uh, a number of rhododendron bushes in front of my house that were uh, planted in the sun, unfortunately. The rhododendron doesn't do too well to indirect sun. So um, they were not, they turned yellowish. Uh, unlike the other rhododendron bushes that were in a shade where they're supposed to be planted. So I thought of uh, effects of sunlight, which is an indication for natrum muriaticum, homeopathic medicine. So I mixed that medicine into the water and started watering them. After about two weeks of watering with that, their leaves were back to completely green and they looked healthy. Wow. So that's another example. So yes, I think, I think that's a very legitimate question. It's, it's, a, it's the personality of the, the homeopath that induces these healing effects? I don't think so. Well, when you deal in hope and the possibilities of things, it's not a dead end street. I have heard from other, from, I went, I, I sat in on a, listening to a, a conversation one day from a gentleman who had cancer and he went to his doctor and his doctor said, you know, you're gonna live, ex, you know, you're not going to live past, blah, blah, blah. He said, why do I want to go to a doctor who has me dead? Yes. Why would you want to do that? Very true. You know, I mean, that. I wouldn't want to go to a doctor once he's dead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if somebody thinks you're going to die, why would you want to continue going? You might as well go somewhere or to someone who's, you know, who, who deals in hope. So it's, and it's not to say don't go to a medical doctor. You know, it says, you know, expand your, you know, use your resources. I know homeopaths work with medical doctors and vice versa, you know, and there's some that work vice versa. So it's, let me ask you something. You said getting, when we talk about getting well, when somebody is treated homeopathically and they are healed, do you say they are healed from this forever? Or is it something with homeopathy has to be revisited? Or how does that work? Good question. There is no such thing as uh, healed forever. For the reasons I mentioned earlier, we live in an environment that uh, makes us sick. Uh, there is not just one carcinogen we encounter in our current society. There are thousands of carcinogens. In our food, the FDA has allowed 56,000 known carcinogens in our food, and we eat it if we don't know what they are and how to be careful and how to avoid it. So um, no, there's no way that we can cure everybody for good and forever. But um, that also depends how much education we can do, how much ultimately people can change their environment. We do have a choice to some degree. Mm -hmm. So for example, I like to use the example of the cell phone. 26,000 studies tell us that they make you sick. Cell phones make you sick because of the radiations they emit. I haven't used a cell phone for 15 years. 
That was my choice. But who is willing to do that? And I tell my clients, here's what I want to tell you. Your uh, lesions in your brain that have been identified by MRIs have also the look like they had in studies when they tested mice and rodents uh, for exposure to um, pulsed high frequency microwave radiation, which is what cell phones emit. Um, I'll leave it up to you. What do you want to do about it? Well, I sometimes go further than that. I explain to them what they could do instead and have some of the same benefits. Cell phones are convenient, right? Mm -hmm. Smartphones, especially. You can get on the computer on your phone. Well, 20 years ago, we didn't have that convenience. We still lived pretty well, didn't we? Yes, we did. So I uh, have done some research on how to make changes, how to protect yourself against some of these things. I once made a list, list of how many disease producing factors are there in our lives. And I stopped at about 100. I felt like there were way more, there are many more, there's just too many for me to write them all down. And there's no way I can tell my clients about all of those. So what would we use instead of a phone? A landline. So <laughs> uh, I use. Yeah. And what about when you're uh, out and about? You don't use the cell phone. No. I'm happy for the break. I don't I need know. to be bothered, interrupted when I'm out so and right. about, when so, I'm with my family. Right. Whatever. So listen, you know, oh, I, I can't believe how, how time has flown by and we're almost out of time. So if somebody from our audience is interested in reaching out to you, what would they do? Call our office and we'll go on our website. The website is homeopathicassociates.com. And the office number is in California, where we practice. It is area code 619-741-5795. 649-741-5795. And, and just for the last moment or two that we're here, what other, I mean, cancer, what else are areas that you mainly focus in on in your practice? Um, Heart disease, nerve diseases. Well, with, that, with that, I include CNS diseases, uh, central nervous system diseases, such as MS, Parkinson's. Uh, these are some of the more difficult diseases to cure. Curative effects in the nervous system take very long. But uh, someone who is suffering from MS, they have lots and lots of time. And those people that do the homeopathic treatment often fare better than the ones who don't. I have published uh, several cured cases. One cured cases of progressive MS uh, is on our website. Um, um, other than that, I don't really specialize. I take whatever disorder is there and I investigate. I promise my client one thing. I'll do the due diligence. That means I'll do the investigation. I find out what I can find out and, and try to um, see what homeopathy can do. Um, and uh, when I find something can be done, I let them know. What about ALS? I've had several cases of ALS. Um, I have... Uh, Seen some good results, but uh, it really depends on how much time do you have, just like with cancer. ALS um, is a deadly disease if it affects your respiratory apparatus. That means the breathing capabilities. And if it's progressing very fast, so that homeopathic treatment is often too slow to get the results before the patient dies. Wow. I believe ALS is a toxic disease. I think anyone who, is ALS, who has ALS and has been diagnosed with ALS should um, investigate it, uh, the uh, toxins that they have. There are specific toxicology tests that can be done. I'd be happy to set up appointments with them to give them information. And then, of course, detoxification takes time, too. Unfortunately, you can't rush things. There are reasons for diseases. Sometimes when we find out, 
it's difficult to undo those reasons in time. Interesting. It almost appears that some of us, or some people who end up with some of these diseases are there for research, unfortunately. Well, listen, this has been terrific. You have been terrific. And you. you're very welcome. But thank you for being here and sharing as much. I would love to have you back again. Kathy even mentioned, which I think would be really interesting, I guess, uh, to do something, and, I'm, and I hope I am understanding her correctly, is to do a show about mourning, you know, and homeopathy, grieving and ho with homeopathy. So many people are grieving something. And I would imagine that would be an interesting show to do. Yeah. So we'll definitely be in touch. I want to thank you so much. And please thank your lovely wife for me for helping to You're say welcome and thank you. Thank Appreciate you. having me on the show. It's our pleasure. And for everyone out there, uh, we love you. We're glad you're here. And it is our duty to do whatever we can to support you in any way we can. And this is one of the ways we get to do it. So thank, thank you, you very much. And we will see you all very, very soon next week. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.